Good afternoon and thank you for joining us once again. I'll start with the usual update on today's statistics. The total number of positive cases reported yesterday was 386. That represents 4.5% of the total number of tests and takes the total number of confirmed tests in Scotland to 202,470. 123 of those new cases were in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 70 in Lothian and 51 in Lanarkshire. The remaining cases were spread across nine other health board areas. 824 people are currently in hospital, that is 13 less than yesterday. 71 people are in intensive care, which is a decrease of seven from yesterday. In addition, no deaths were registered in the last 24 hours of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. But as you know, we often report a low number of deaths on Monday because registration offices tend to be closed at the weekend. Since I spoke at Friday's briefing, a total of 20 deaths have been registered, and that takes the total number of deaths registered under the definition used in our daily figures to 7,131. Once again, we remember that behind every one of those numbers is a loved one whose loss is greatly mourned, and I send my condolences to all of those who've lost a loved one. I'm joined today by Dr. Gregor Smith, our Chief Medical Officer, who will say a few words after me, and who will also, of course, help answer the questions. Before that, there are three issues that I want to highlight. The first is our vaccination programme. An IT issue, unfortunately, prevents me from giving you confirmation of the position as at 8.30 this morning. However, those confirmed figures will be published by Public Health Scotland at 2 p.m. today on their COVID dashboard. I can give you the figures from yesterday, which were that a total of 1,593,695 people had received their first dose and 76,512 their second dose. These numbers will obviously have increased by today. We've already given a first dose to virtually all care home residents, all over 70 year olds and all health and care workers. As of yesterday, 95% of those aged 65 to 69 have now received their first dose of the vaccine. So have 32% of 60 to 64 year olds 27% of 55 to 59 year olds and 22% of 50 to 54 year olds. So supplies permitting, we continue to expect to be able to offer a first dose to all over 50 year olds, to all unpaid carers and to all adults with underlying health conditions by the middle of April. The second issue I want to update you on relates to the three cases that were identified in Scotland yesterday of people who have contracted one of the new variants of the virus. Dr. Smith will say a bit more about this shortly, but let me briefly say the following. The variant identified yesterday is sometimes known as the Brazilian variant of concern, or P1, because it is associated with the resurgence of cases that has been seen in Brazil. We know that current vaccines are effective against the strains of the virus that have already been established in the UK. However, more work is required to determine that this remains the case for emerging strains of the virus, such as the one we're highlighting today from Brazil. That's why so much effort is going into stopping it spreading further while the work is underway with respect to the vaccine. The three individuals concerned had traveled from Brazil to Scotland via Paris and London. They self-isolated on their arrival in Scotland, and when they tested positive for COVID, they all stayed in isolation for a further 10 days. Because they had arrived from Brazil, a designated high-risk country, their test results were selected for genomic sequencing. That is why we now have been able to confirm that they had the P1 variant. As a precautionary measure, Test and Protect teams are now identifying all possible contacts of these cases and the contacts of those contacts so that they can take tests. We're also contacting other passengers who were on the flight the individuals took 
from Heathrow, Heathrow to Aberdeen. That is flight BA1312, which departed from Heathrow on the afternoon of Friday the 29th of January. If you were on that flight and have not yet been contacted, you will be contacted shortly, so please wait for that. I want to stress that there is currently no reason to believe that the P1 variant of the virus is in circulation in Scotland. However, I hope this summary reassures you that we are doing everything we can and everything that is necessary to check whether this variant of the virus could have been transmitted within Scotland and to identify and break any possible chains of transmission. These three cases remind us once again how careful we need to be in guarding against new variants. That is why the Scottish Government has put in place such strong travel restrictions. And it is why, as we all work to reduce case numbers, it's important to avoid large groups, not only to reduce transmission, but to reduce the opportunity the virus has to mutate. The final point I want to reflect on is that it is exactly one year ago today since the first case of COVID was identified in Scotland. During the last 12 months, our lives have been turned upside down in ways which would have been absolutely unimaginable at the beginning of 2020. For thousands of families who have lost loved ones to this virus, as the figures I read out at the start remind us, the last 12 months have brought grief and heartbreak. Very many people have been anxious about their own health or that of their loved ones, or they have faced economic hardship due to re redundancy or furlough. For all of us, the forced separation from friends and loved ones has been and is hard to endure. And of course, for many people in our health and social care workforce, the last year has been the most difficult and stressful of their professional career. The entire country is grateful for everything that you have done. The Scottish Government is currently talking to health charities, family organisations, about how we should co commemorate the pandemic, marking the loss of life and the sacrifices people have made. And we will say more about that in the coming days. For the moment, it is impossible to adequately express how grateful I am for everything that people across Scotland have done and endured during the last 12 months, and for the tireless, unrelenting work of our health and social care staff and those who have kept our vital public services running. We owe you an enormous debt of gratitude. But I do want to stress that your sacrifices have made a difference. They have undoubtedly saved lives. At the moment, through those sacrifices, you are helping to reduce the number of people who are getting COVID and falling seriously ill from it. And that will help us to come out of lockdown safely in the weeks and months ahead. The success of our vaccination programme means that after 12 long months, an end to the pandemic may now be in sight. But for the moment, as today's news reminds us, what we need to do is to continue to be very careful. And we do still need to stick to the current rules and guidance. So let me close once again by reminding us all of what those are. The most important rule for now remains the same. Please stay at home. In any level four area, which of course includes all of mainland Scotland, you must only leave house, your house for essential purposes. You cannot meet up with other households outdoors. If you meet up with someone outdoors, you can only meet one other person from one other household. You must work from home if you possibly can, and employers have a legal duty to support people to work from home. And when you do leave the house, we should continue to remember facts. Wear face coverings when you're likely to come into close contact with any other person, avoid anywhere busy, clean hands and surfaces, use two metre distancing if you're talking to someone from another household, and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. Above all else, though, please stay at home as much as possible. That is how we continue to protect each other while the vaccination programme does its job. So please stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives. And thank you, every single one of you, once again, for doing just that. Now let's turn to uh, Dr Smith.
for the brief words he has to say. Thanks. As the Cabinet Secretary has just said, the first cases involving the SARS-CoV-2 variant of concern, sometimes referred to as the P1 variant, have been identified in Scotland using genomic sequencing technology. This variant was originally identified in Japan and has been closely associated with the area around the city of Manaus in Brazil. These three cases relate to individuals resident in the NHS Grampian Health Board area who returned to Scotland from Brazil. I first want to pay tribute to colleagues in Public Health Scotland and the local public health team in NHS Grampian under the excellent leadership of Director of Public Health Susan Webb who took immediate and effective action on receiving notification of the sequencing results. This includes undertaking further interviews with the index cases and enhanced contact tracing and testing of all contacts. This has involved an additional step of tracing the contacts of contacts too. Included in the overall contact tracing are the passengers on the flight from London to Aberdeen that the index cases travelled on when returning to Scotland. The process of contacting these passengers has already begun, and if they have recently been tested and found to be positive, the test samples will be identified and further sequencing undertaken on these two. All of these actions are appropriate, but entirely precautionary. The individuals who have tested positive isolated on return from Brazil, and we have no evidence to suggest that there are any further cases involving this variant of concern at this time. The three Scottish cases, along with three unrelated cases identified in England, are the first involving the P1 variant in the UK. As I mentioned, this variant, which was first identified in Tokyo in cases involving Brazilian visitors, is associated with the, city, oh, sorry, with the area around the city of Manaus in Brazil, which experienced a significant second wave of infections despite high levels of infection and high seroprevalence during the first wave. It includes three changes or mutations considered to be of particular note that are undergoing assessment of their impact on transmission and on immune escape. But this is also not the first variant of concern to appear in the UK. Three other variants of concern have already been identified in the UK and remain under close scrutiny. The B117 variant, which was first identified in Kent, has gone on to become the predominant viral strain in circulation whilst other variants continue to be monitored too. We are already beginning to see the benefits of our COVID vaccination programme, so it's critical we are vigilant against the potential impact of these variants and others as they arise. Indeed, as we create stronger immunity through our vaccination programme, that may place the virus under greater selection pressure, which could in turn increase the chances of the virus mutating further. That's why it's especially important that we continue to suppress transmission to as low a level as possible for now. Put simply, the more virus that there is around, the more likely these mutations are to appear. So while not all variants will be of concern, some will be. Those are the ones that may increase the severity of disease, may increase transmissibility, or even to reduce the current vaccine-induced immune response. There is still much that we need to learn about variants like P1, even if the effect of vaccines become reduced, these can now be rapidly adapted to respond to new threats if we remain vigilant to this risk. And beyond even that, it's becoming clearer that other parts of the immune system may have some additional residual impact if our, if our body's own antibodies become less responsive to these new variants too. However, it remains important that we prevent these variants of concern becoming established in the UK. And that's why it's important to ensure all steps are taken to identify them and prevent wider transmission becoming established. That's why we've put in place stricter policies to prevent importation of these variants through a combination of mandatory quarantine of returning travellers, testing, sequencing, and then enhanced investigation of cases and their contacts. If these policies are to be effective, we need to be able to identify variants through genomic surveillance. The UK Genomic Surveillance Programme that Scotland is part of is world leading and is now sequencing an increasing proportion of all our positive test samples. While it's important that we continue to grow our genomic surveillance and sequencing capacity in the UK, it's also essential that this capacity grows globally too. We need as many countries as possible using genomic surveillance and sequencing to quickly identify variants of concern if we are to keep up 
with the inevitable changes in this virus in the future. This way, we can ensure that we can respond and adapt our vaccine technologies as quickly as possible. Keeping pace with this virus is something that we'll be doing for a long time in the future yet. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregor. Uh, let's turn now to the journalists who've joined us today. And first is Ben Phillip from BBC Scotland. Thank you very much, Health Secretary. On the Brazil variant that has been detected in northeast Scotland, do we know at which point during the three travellers' isolation did they first test positive for the virus? What date was that? And how confident are authorities that this hasn't spread any further within uh, the local community or indeed on the flight that these people were taking from London to Aberdeen on the uh, 29th of January? Um, and a question about another issue, if I may, uh, there's uh, growing scientific evidence that unfitted masks are not enough to protect the wearer from getting COVID-19. Are you reviewing the evidence for wearing fully fitted masks, particularly in hospitals? And what evidence do you have to reassure staff that they are safe wearing simple surgical masks? Thanks very much, Ben. Let, let me take that last question first, if I may. I'll say a little bit about your first point, but... Um, Gregor will deal with that in much more detail. On, on the question of uh, what is adequate PPE for our health and social care staff, uh, whether they're in hospital in primary care or working in care homes or the community, we take that really seriously and have adapted uh, the PPE that we provide in line with the clinical advice that we get about what is the right PPE in what circumstance but we also have a situation where individual members of staff in NHS or in care uh, are able to exercise their own professional judgment about the circumstance that they face and whether or not they believe that they need additional PPE to that that is clinically, clinically recommended. That clinical uh, recommendation work, review about the evidence, uh, whether uh, the new variants, now the dominant variant that we're dealing with uh, here in Scotland, uh, remains pertinent and right, is co a continuous exercise, uh, led often by our chief nursing officer, but also involving our other clinical advisors and colleagues uh, throughout the UK. Uh, as and when they change their guidance and advice, then we implement that uh, as the decision makers. Uh, what I do know is that our PPE stocks are very strong. We now have, uh, thanks to the actions of uh, my colleague, Mr. McKee, and the uh, work of uh, manufacturers here in Scotland, we now have a significant domestic supply chain for PPE, which is uh, of real reassurance to us about any demand that may exist in the future, any increase in demand. Uh, so we will continue to look at that but the individual staff members' own professional assessment of the circumstance they're in, the uh, patient or the client that they're working with, uh, remains really important and is a, a position that I clarified some months ago with COSLA and the unions involved. But we'll continue to look at that. In terms of uh, your points about uh, the Brazilian uh, variant and the three cases here in Scotland, of course, what I would point to is the fact that um, test and protect our uh, contact tracing uh, exercise has really come in to its own in, in situations like this where it uh, tracks down the contacts of cases and the contacts of the contacts of cases including uh, individuals who were on that particular flight from Heathrow uh, to Aberdeen in order to ensure that we uh, identify where any additional cases are and break the chains of transmission through the isolation, self-isolation of those individuals. But the other uh, detail of the question that you asked, I'm sure Gregor will be able to help us with. So Ben, two parts to your question. If we deal with the Brazilian variant, first of all, um, the, the travellers who returned and entered isolation were asymptomatic during the course of their travel and when they entered isolation, they subsequently developed symptoms and sought testing uh, during the early part of the isolation period. So um, the contact tracing that is currently being um, undertaken just now is uh, an extra layer of 
precaution that we think is appropriate um, at this point in time. In relation to how we continue to monitor the evidence around about transmission and the use of PPE, um, there is evidence which is continually generated both across the UK and from international uh, researchers, which is considered by particularly two main groups in uh, the UK who provide us with continual advice. That's um, NERTAG, the new and emerging respiratory virus threat assessment group, and also the nosocomial subgroup of SAGE, which looks at all this evidence and updates any advice to ourselves and to ministers as they feel that it's appropriate. They continually look at the emergence of new variants. They've considered very deeply the impact of any evidence that there is for particularly the B117 variant, sometimes referred to as the Kent variant, as it's grown in its proportion across the UK. And at this moment in time, they've not made any additional recommendations that should be undertaken in terms of increasing that level of um, infection prevention and control within any environments at this point in time. But they will continue to monitor this, they will continue to look and follow the evidence, and they'll make further recommendations if anything changes. Thanks very much, Gregor. Uh, Louise Jose from STV News. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. Um, first of all, just on the Brazilian variant, um, just how concerned should people be about this and, and what reassurances uh, can you give? And secondly, just looking at care homes, if I may, um, today care, people in care homes are finally being reunited uh, with their loved ones uh, with indoor visiting. But we are hearing concerns from some relatives that not all providers are implementing the guidance. At one home, for example, we're hearing that only one designated visitor is allowed with no physical contact. So just looking to see what you would say to reassure families and care providers about this. Let me deal with the care homes question, and I, I know Gregor can pick up on the, uh, your points on the Brazilian variant. Uh, on, on care homes, it, it is uh, an important start to uh, the situation in care homes that from this week onwards, uh, I expect to see uh, all care home providers applying the guidance that we have published last week. Now, that guidance was developed with Scottish Care, with WCPS, uh, with care home providers themselves, with care home relatives, as well as with strong input, of course, from uh, our clinical advisors. And it is because we have nine layers of protection now around uh, residents in our care homes, everything from uh, good quality infection prevention and control through to testing uh, before admission or return from hospital of existing residents, testing of staff now happening three times a week, testing available for visitors and visiting professionals, and PPE, which we touched on in an earlier answer. Uh, and of course, the vaccination program now going back in to care homes to provide residents and staff with the second final vaccination in order to complete the vaccination program and protection. It's because of that, that we are collectively confident that it is the right time to address the other risk uh, to residents and families in care homes, and that is the risk of isolation and loneliness caused by the necessary restrictions that were put in place. Now, I've had uh, two meetings, I think, now with care home providers to talk through uh, the emerging uh, thinking and guidance that we had, and then the final draft guidance before we published it. And what I've said is that I am uh, anxious to talk to any individual provider that has any remaining concerns about implementing the guidance or any practical problems. We've also provided support if they've got practical problems in implementing it. Uh, just last week, Barchester, uh, a major provider across the UK, uh, moved its position from saying that it needed all visitors to have been vaccinated to saying that they accepted that that was not required. They would like it, but it was not required. Uh, HC1, uh, one of the major providers in Scotland, has given me their reassurance that they will be implementing the guidance. Now, uh, where there are individual care home providers who've got a concern, then I want to meet them and talk that through with them so that we can address the concerns they have. I don't expect every care home to get to two designated visitors 
by the end of this week. They need to have their plans in place. They need to be able to organise and coordinate the visits so that they can physically accommodate those. Uh, and for some, they may need to make some rearrangement in their uh, home, in the physical uh, building of their home, in order to ensure that testing of visitors can take place in a safe place and that there is a proper uh, safe place for visitors to uh, don and take off any PPE that is required. But I certainly expect that by the middle of March, with our continuous help and support and the support of Scottish Care, that we will get to a position where all our providers, except where they have an outbreak of COVID, all our providers will be offering this really vital uh, contact, meaningful contact between family members and their loved ones in care homes. Uh, Gregor. Yeah, let's say a little bit more then about the P1 variant, which has been um, discovered in these three cases. So all viruses mutate. It's just what viruses do. Over time, they begin to change, and either the RNA or the DNA, depending on what type of virus, gradually evolves over time and shows different features. With the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what we're starting to see is those changes beginning to alter the characteristics and behaviours of some of the virus. And that's why we become particularly interested in some of these variants. And the variant of concern label is applied to those that have changes which may be associated with um, a, a, an increased concern of either increased transmissibility or perhaps with starts to, to show signs of immune escape in some way as well. And that's the case with the P1 variant just now, is there is interest in particular in this virus has been given the label of variant of concern because two of the mutations that we see within this virus at the N501 site and at the E484 site may be associated with conferring increased transmissibility or increased um, ability to be able to escape from the body's immune response. That's not proven yet, and further work has been undertaken to assess exactly what the impacts of these changes might be in this particular variant. So when we have the identification of a virus such as this within Scotland, there are a particular train of actions that then take place because clearly we would not want that virus to become established. It becomes even more important to make sure that we're chasing down any potential routes of transmission to make sure that all steps have been taken to try to root that out, isolate people and make sure that it doesn't get a chance to establish itself in the plethora of other viral variants that we have across the country just now. In the case of the Aberdeen, um, it does appear to be a fairly contained incident in that these travellers were isolated on their return before they developed symptoms. But the right thing to do, the appropriate thing to do, and the proportionate thing to do is to make sure that we continue to chase down any potential contacts that these individuals might have had with other people to make sure that we don't allow this um, particular strain of the virus to become established. Thanks very much, Gregor. Uh, now, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you just said that after 12 long months, the end of the pandemic could be in sight. I was wondering if you might be able to say when you think that might be. And looking specifically at the south of Scotland, the uh, case numbers for both Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish borders are encouragingly low. If that continues, might there be a case, as the First Minister has suggested, that when it comes to reintroducing the level system, those areas could go down to level two and not level three, which would obviously have a massive uh, positive impact, particularly on things like uh, hospitality and self-catering businesses in the south of Scotland. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, Gregor may want to say a few words uh, on this too. Um, let me start by saying um, I, I dearly wish, I so dearly wish, that I could stand here today and say X date will see the end of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I wish it as much as any of you watching wish it. But I can't do that, and it wouldn't be responsible to even make an attempt at it. What we can do and what we are doing is setting out really clearly what we believe are the necessary steps between where we are now, uh, with uh, primary P1 to 3 children back at school, early learning, small number uh, of senior phase uh, pupils also 
back who need to be uh, involved in face-to-face -face learning for uh, the exams and the subjects that they follow, uh, the three-week uh, intervals between each of those steps that First Minister outlined uh, just last week, uh, and our hope that if everything we are doing, everything you're all doing, in abiding by the restrictions that are currently in place, the easing of those restrictions as we take those steps forward, but the spirit of the easing, not pushing it too far beyond what we are saying, in fact, not pushing it at all beyond what we say, all of those steps are essential if we continue to see the prevalence uh, of the virus reducing, the numbers and the pressure on our NHS uh, declining so that those staff who've worked so hard for 12 months can get some kind of respite, and our vaccination programme continues to work uh, harder, in fact, than it is able to do right at the minute as supplies come in and we can ramp it up yet again as all of that happens, then we hope that by that uh, date uh, in uh, April, the 26th of April was the indicative date, that the whole country can move from where it is now to level three. Could we do more than that? We will see. Now, we're not being deliberately obtuse here. You all know, as, as well as I do, over the last 12 months, how much we've all learned. We're not being deliberately obtuse or difficult or secretive about this. It's simply the case, as you all know, that you need to see how the actions you take play out in terms of being able to suppress the virus to the lowest possible level, contain it, deal with something like the Brazilian variant and not see that take hold in any respect, that you need time to do that. And so you can indicate the direction of travel, but until the data comes through that allows you to check whether your expectation has been met about decline, you can't know. And that's why we've set out those indicative dates, but also said, if we can move faster, because the evidence tells us we can move faster, we will move faster. If we can do more, because the evidence tells us that we could do more, then we'll do that. But what none of us wants, none of us, is to take steps forward too quickly, only to have to take steps back. So that's why I can't give you that end of the pandemic date that I would dearly love to, and I know you dearly love to hear, but I am certain that you understand the necessary caution and the rationale for the way that we're approaching this right now. Gregor. Peter, um, it's important to remember in all of this that uh, a pandemic is a global event and it's not something which is just particular to Scotland. So when we're considering statements such as the end of the pandemic, it's important to recognise that, that that actually happens, needs to happen on a global basis. And it's important that we leave no country behind as, as we're approaching that, because um, if we do that, if we um, allow that to be forgotten, then there is always the possibility that some countries in the world will continue to see high levels of the coronavirus uh, infection within their communities. And that creates additional possibilities of introducing new variants, just as we've seen in uh, the case in Scotland over the last few days. So uh, a pandemic is a global event. And eventually, um, WHO will make a judgment as to when we pass from that pandemic phase into um, a subsequent phase, whatever that might be. But that doesn't stop us in Scotland from taking our own steps to make sure that we walk through the stages towards that and make sure that we have as few cases as possible and suppress the, the uh, disease here as much as is possible. There are many things that we can do and are doing just now that will help take us forward in that regard, particularly the vaccination programme. And as we develop greater levels of both um, vaccine-mediated immunity and naturally acquired immunity, it becomes more and more likely that that infection will be um, less uh, impactful to people across Scotland. What the end game looks like just now still isn't clear because there are vital missing bits of information that we still need. Most important amongst those just now, and we're starting to get some of that information through, is what is the impact on the vaccines that we have currently at our disposal on transmission. And once we have certainty about that, 
we'll be able to say with much greater degree of certainty exactly what type of infectious disease construct we're likely to see with the coronavirus in the future. Now, I'm still very hopeful that that transmission is going to have quite a powerful impact um, in terms of the way that vaccines act against it. And so I can still see the possibility that a construct which is very similar to what we already have with, for instance, measles, is well within our grasp, suppressing disease to as low a level as possible so that we deal with outbreaks when there's fresh introductions from places outside Scotland when they arise. And that's something we've become very familiar with in terms of our approach to measles over many, many years. So depending exactly what we see next with the evidence from the vaccine programme, we'll be able to make a much firmer conclusion as to exactly how these next few months play out and how we respond to that over that time. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, now we have uh, Greg Flucker from uh, Original 106. Good afternoon. With the arrival of the new Brazilian variant in the northeast, it's obviously raised further concerns about how easily variants can reach us through international travel. What are you able to tell us about the circumstances of the journey that these people made uh, and what impact do the rules that have been brought in since then around managed quarantine have in going far enough to stopping this thing happening in the future? Thanks very much, Greg. Of course, your point is really well made about the importance of doing everything we can to manage our borders. Uh, and that is why uh, the Scottish Government uh, has taken the steps it has taken in terms of managed quarantine and why we continue to talk with the UK Government and with our colleagues in Wales and Northern Ireland about what more can be done and should be done in order to uh, control that risk of inward transmission uh, from elsewhere. Um, it's not about blaming other countries, it's simply a straightforward recognition of the fact that, as Gregor said, this virus mutates, it's what it does, and some of those uh, mutations can bring a risk, a variant of concern that we need to guard against. And as everyone works so hard to suppress case levels here in Scotland, it is uh, important that we also do all we can to minimise the risk of inward transmission and also of transmission from Scotland out into the rest of the world. It, it is a two-way street. Uh, on your specific questions about this variant and how it was, uh, how the individuals uh, were uh, involved in that, and, and it is important to say that there is absolutely no blame at all to anything that they did. Their behaviour was exactly as would have been expected in terms of their self-isolation and during that period being tested and then continuing to stay in isolation uh, once they tested positive. Uh, but the wider part of your question, I'll give to Joe Gregor. So one of the things that I think is really evident here is the need for surveillance. I mentioned in the, the kind of opening statement that, that again, there's a, there's, there's a real need for all countries around the world to really reflect and consider whether their ability, their capacity, and their capability to be able to do genomic surveillance to the degree that we will need in the future is currently in place. And if not, um, they will probably need to make a judgment as to whether to, to expand their capacity into that area. I have no doubt at all that this is an area which has uh, been of extreme importance to the UK and been able to identify variants of concern when they arise quickly so that steps can be taken. For instance, um, in, in this case, in uh, Brazil, it was that genomic sequencing that identified that this was a particular variant of interest that allowed further testing and so forth to, to be taking place. And I think that for the future, um, it's something that um, countries around the world are going to be looking very, very closely at to make sure that they've got the capacity within their own countries to be able to take similar means to be able to protect their citizens. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, Neil Puran from PA. Thanks, Health Secretary. Just following on from Greg's question there around international travel, um, you might have seen uh, Debbie Schroeder said that it uh, shows the limitations of a, a red list only system because, of course, the, the people who uh, ultimately flew to Aberdeen came via London and Paris. So when you next have these four nation talks around international travel, uh, are you going to make the case that this shows we need far tougher quarantine rules? and 
also for Dr. Smith on the contact tracing going around uh, those people who've been identified as having the Brazilian variants. Um, I take it that's not the same as surge testing that we saw in some places in England uh, last year when some other variants emerged. Uh, what would need to happen for you to introduce surge testing and more broadly, what would the next steps be if this variant starts to spread in the community? Thank, thanks very much, Neil. Um, uh, I completely agree with um, Professor Schroeder. Um, that's why this government has, uh, the Scottish government has consistently argued that the red list as the sole means of uh, introducing and uh, providing managed quarantine is inadequate and why we continue to argue that it should be for all international arrivals. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that, as, as you've heard, um, the virus mutates. It, it can be mutating in any country. Um, it's not enough just to signal some as really critical. That matters. But it could appear elsewhere. And of course, if genomic sequencing is not uh, where we need it to be across the globe, as Gregor has indicated, then that uh, doesn't help manage the risk either. So every time we have those Four Nations discussions, whether it is uh, me as a, a Four Nation discussion with my colleague health ministers, or whether it is uh, one that involves the First Minister and First Ministers and uh, uh, Michael Gove from uh, the other nations of the UK, uh, we continue to press the point that our uh, control of our international borders is a critical step in managing the risk of coronavirus and in bringing down the levels uh, here in the UK. So that continues uh, to be our uh, main uh, argument, if you like, our main uh, area that we seek to persuade uh, the UK government to take steps on, and, and we'll keep on doing that. Yeah, let me say a little bit about the, the approach that's been taken with these three cases because it's important, first of all, to understand that when we say surge testing, there's all sorts of definitions for surge testing and what that means. I think the cases that you were um, referring to there in England and the use of surge testing was when there was um, some concern around about um, community transmission uh, within, with some of those variants of concern and so there was widespread testing used within those communities. The, the approach that's been taken here in Aberdeen is one which has been led by our um, skilled public health professionals. They conducted an IMT, they had several over the weekend, course of the weekend, looking at the risk that was associated with these cases and examining exactly where um, additional steps were needed in order that we could um, assure ourselves that the, there was no likelihood of escape into surrounding um, communities. Um, th they, is additional contact tracing as a result of that. And it's not just the contacts of those index cases who have been contacted, but contacts of contacts as well. And there is additional testing which has been deployed as well to make sure that we are covering all eventualities as well. So such testing takes on lots of different forms. And it's really important that as we are assessing how to respond to any incident such as this, is that those healthcare professionals are guiding us and making sure that we're using the resources appropriately uh, to find any additional cases. Thanks, Gregor. And it's, it's also, I think, just worth saying before we move on that, of course, uh, we do do a lot more uh, asymptomatic community testing. Now, uh, I think the last time I saw the numbers, we had uh, asymptomatic community testing running in 20 of our local authorities, more coming on board. Uh, and that is to do a, a number of things, depends what is appropriate in each area. It may be, as we did before the turn of the year, uh, testing in order to tackle particular parts of the country where uh, the case numbers remained stubbornly high and weren't shifting. So trying to identify uh, more positive cases there in order to break transmission and contain it uh, and bring the case numbers down. It can be where we have a particular outbreak uh, where we bring in additional community testing, again, for the same reason, to identify all the positive cases, contain the outbreak, and break the chains of transmission. And it can be, as Gregor has just said, in, in other areas, for example, additional testing capacity in and around the current situation with the three cases uh, that are uh, linked to Aberdeen. 
So there's different community testing that we now engage in, in addition to the significant expansion in symptomatic testing sites through local testing centres, mobile testing units, and of course our regional testing centres. Let's turn now to Mark McLaughlin of The Times. Good afternoon to everyone um, for the, the Chief Medical Officer. Uh, test positivity over the last fortnight fell below the World Health Organization's 5%, and hospital cases are also falling twice the rate as forecasters uh, predicted. Um, we expect a cautious announcement from Nicholas Sturgeon tomorrow, um, but a lot of people will be thinking if all of these things are pointing in the right direction, then why can't we open up sooner? And again, we, we won't have another briefing tomorrow. Maybe you can preempt that by, by just explaining why um, these measures are leading to a faster relaxation. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. I'll say a couple of things about that, if I may, uh, and I'm sure Gregor uh, will want to provide more detail behind it. Um, so the, the numbers that you've um, just reminded us of there, Mark, are, of course, uh, good numbers and reasons to be optimistic. Uh, but, uh, and there is, a, there is a but, the but is that we need to see that reduction sustained. Uh, and that's why our review periods are three-week review periods, uh, in order to be sure that the reductions that we're seeing in test positivity, in uh, case numbers, in the impact then, remembering there's always a lag, an impact then on numbers in hospital and numbers in ICU and regrettably numbers of deaths. Uh, they all lag behind uh, this data. Uh, that's why we, we have that three week period uh, of review to be sure that individual daily bits of good news actually are embedded and sustained because that gives us the confidence as the vaccination programme proceeds, something we didn't have a year ago, as it proceeds, uh, offering that layer of protection that it does offer and with the hope that it will offer more in terms of impact on transmission, but not yet absolutely certain about that. That's why, uh, as we proceed with all of that, we can identify uh, the area of room we've got to take further steps, remembering that any time you ease a restriction, you risk an increase in prevalence. So you need to be able to do that from the lowest possible level and then again ease the restriction, check how that plays out. Does it, does it produce the results that you hoped it would produce? Does that then give you room to take the next step? Now, you're right, the First Minister will uh, give the COVID briefing to Parliament tomorrow and that she will set out uh, any further steps that we think we can take. Uh, whether or not we think there is anything at this point uh, to suggest any change of tho in those. Nobody listening to me should take that as there will be a change or there won't be a change. It will be set out tomorrow by the First Minister in Parliament and we will know then, all of us, what we need to do next. Gregor. Mark, there's a lot of encouraging signs that we're seeing now and when I look at the data uh, from today, what I can see is uh, it tells me that in, in ICU there are 71 patients and that's down uh, further again over the la course of the, the, the weekend, that there were 45 admissions to ICU in the week to the 28th of February, 78 in the week to the 21st of February. So the figures are going in the right direction, and I agree with you that that makes me more optimistic. But if you'd asked me this same question last week, I would probably have given you a different answer, because this time last week I was more concerned and uneasy that we were stuck. And in fact, when you looked at the seven-day figures from the week before that, we actually had more cases in the previous seven days than the seven days before that. So it's these trends over a longer period of time that become really, really important to know to, and to, to kind of chart and to make sure that we have sustained progress. Otherwise, at the kind of level of infections that we were seeing across the country at that point in time, if I look at the seven days to the 25th of February, we had an average of 779 cases per day. At that type of level of infection, it doesn't take much for things to really spark off quickly again. And that represented only a kind of 6% reduction in cases 
over those seven days. That's that's quite slow, I have to say, and probably is related to the um, the, the predominance of the B117 variant. I think since this point in time last week, we have seen some optimistic signs that things are starting to move again. We'll continue to chart that over the next few days. And I'm sure that all these various elements will be taken into full consideration as we chart our next steps into how we start to change the restrictions that are currently in place. Thank you very much. Uh, Georgina Hayes from The Telegraph. Thank you both. Um, just to follow up on Mark's question, uh, the, the number of people in hospital with COVID, um, it has dropped to a level that um, the Scottish government's forecasters hadn't expected to reach until the end of March, I believe, um, even under the most optimistic scenario, which arguably puts the country's battle against the virus around a month ahead of schedule. So um, obviously you've mentioned, uh, you know, evidence-based approaches to easing lockdown and wanting to see a more sort of sustained progress. Um, and arguably, a lot of people might see that figure specifically and think, OK, well, you know, this is sustained progress, especially in terms of hospital hospitalizations and deaths. So um, if this trajectory does continue, is this the kind of thing we could look at as an indication of whether there will be an acceleration of the easing of lockdown? And if not, um, I'm just wondering what the data is that the public can look to to think, you know, this is a sign that things might be eased sooner rather than later? I mean, is it still mostly cases or is it hospitalizations? Or, you know, will we get to a point where hospitalizations do become more important than the number of cases we get um, in terms of easing lockdown? Thank you. Uh, th thanks very much, Georgina. I'm, I'm going to let Gregor say a bit more uh, about this. Um, I think the key word here is sustained progress. And uh, the numbers that we see, we've seen most recently uh, are signs uh, that are encouraging. They, they do give us reasons to be optimistic, um, as the vaccination programme also gives us reasons to be optimistic. But, but no single thing on its own. And people watching this, know, you know this. You've been with us for 12 months or more now. You, you know this very, very well indeed. There is no single piece of data that is the trigger to do one thing or do another. It is the combination of all that evidence that allows our clinical advisors, the senior ones like Gregor here and others, to give us their advice, allows modelers to model what they think might happen. And from that, the judgment decisions need to be made by the First Minister and her cabinet. And we know that that's how it works. So we should be encouraged by the data that we're seeing just now but we shouldn't take one piece of it and think that that then tells us automatically that we go and do X or Y. It, it doesn't work like that. You all know that. But, but you also know that if we can move quickly or more quickly than we've set out, then we will do that. There, there is no reason to retain restrictions that we have other than suppressing the virus and giving us the best chance of moving out of the current pandemic. That's the overall driving force behind this. And of course, in doing that, reducing the number of people who uh, have to go to hospital and certainly reducing the number of people who die from coronavirus. That's, that's the motivation. Um, and so we need to balance all of that. How do we maintain that reduction in hospital numbers and in deaths coming from reduction in prevalence in cases whilst we also work out how we can ease the restrictions that we know are really hard for people to bear, especially after 12 months. Um, but it is a difficult balance to strike, and we can't take uh, single-day data or even data over two or three days as the final indicator of the direction of travel that we're going in. We need to see it sustained, hence the three-week period for the review, hence the seven-day average that Gregor has talked about, that we talk about frequently at these briefings. Gregor. Georgina, thanks. Um, the, the, the use of mathematical modelling and analysis has been incredibly important, incredibly valuable over the, the last 12 months. It's been one of our um, huge assets in charting our progress, particularly as we uh, either consider applying restrictions or begin to exit those. And those models have become, um, as I say, quite familiar to us all. Um, 
but they need to be taken in context. They need to also be taken in the context of the real world data that we see and that we use and that we become familiar with as well. Um, when I leave the house in the morning, um, I look at the weather forecast and it tells me what the best prediction of the weather is going to be like for that day or the next day. But I also look out the window just to see exactly what it's doing just now. And it's that real world evidence again that, that sometimes helps to influence uh, the decision making as well. It's all these information sources taken in the round that become important to us when assessing when we make a move and what move that we make. And there are a variety of data sources that we use in addition to the mathematical modelling that have become absolutely vital to us. And that sustained period of um, uh, trend in any of those data sources becomes really important in giving us the confidence that what we're not seeing is just statistical blip, but actually is something which is indicative of an underlying trend with this virus as it affects society. So whether it be positivity, whether it be the case rate, whether it be the hospital or the ICU numbers, all of these things give additional information and additional confidence that the moves that we advise ministers on are, are the right moves to be taking. And I think that it is right that we do that to the best of our ability to move at a pace that is proportionate to the risk but also that doesn't risk us um, sparking off increased infection again, because that would be, um, frankly, a disaster if we started to move too early at a point in time when the data hasn't yet stabilised to the extent and it's giving us a false indication of what's actually happening there. So we'll continue to review that. We review it on a daily basis. We continue to look at all the data sources. We use that in conjunction with the modelling. And only at that point do we provide the advice for ministers to take the decision on. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, Rachel Watson from Daily Mail. Thank you. I just wanted to go back again to the Brazil variant. And I wondered, could you tell, you might have said this already and I've missed it, but could you tell us how many people were on the flight and how many, uh, the BA flight from Heathrow to Aberdeen that you're looking for? And you've, there's been a lot of questions about the easing of lockdown restrictions. How could this impact the easing of restrictions going forward? Do you imagine that there will be any slower releasing of restrictions because of this new variant? So, so on, on your last point, and again, uh, Gregor may want to say something about this. Uh, the key here is having identified the cases, undertaken the tracing of the contacts and the contacts of the contacts. The purpose of all of that is to ensure that there's no uh, community transmission of this Brazilian variant. Uh, so uh, that's the success of being able to do that uh, means that we will be able to contain it. Although you have to constantly be alert through genomic sequencing that Gregor has uh, spoken about before uh, to whether or not there is the introduction of more of those cases. Back to our point about international borders and the importance of uh, managing and tightening those international borders as much as you can. And therefore our view as a government that red list countries alone is the means of doing that is insufficient. So all of these things are connected. Uh, but at this point, um, given the significant work that's un being undertaken, uh, led by our public health uh, experts in the Northeast and uh, with the support nationally, um, there is no reason at this point to believe that we are doing anything other than containing any transmission, any possible transmission from those three cases and therefore, there's nothing necessarily to say that it has an impact on the steps that the First Minister set out last week, are the steps out of where we are now uh, towards the end of April. And then, as you know, she said in the middle of March, we will say a bit more about what happens thereafter. Uh, but you'll have heard the caveats around what I've said. There is nothing at this point to indicate. But we go back, international borders are critical. Being able to manage uh, travellers who come uh, into the UK from countries out with the UK, manage that isolation uh, so that we are sure that they are, they are not incubating uh, any variants or uh, coronavirus or any variants of coronavirus so that we can uh, prevent the transmission uh, more widely than that. 
Now, just on your point about uh, the numbers, uh, the numbers are not yet confirmed. We, we do know and are, uh, have contacted uh, 20 passengers on that uh, London to Aberdeen flight. There is more uh, work still to do there, and that work is underway uh, as I speak. Uh, they will all be contacted, uh, provided we have all their details. They will all be contacted. They'll be asked uh, the necessary questions by the contact tracing team, and steps will be taken if those steps are needed. Um, and then we are, as we've said, contacts of the contacts. Gregor. Yeah, the, the INT has the ability to be able to escalate any concerns that they have in terms of the control measures they can put in place of what needs to be um, influenced at uh, a national level. And at the moment in time, uh, there, there's been no um, concern raised or escalation process which has been uh, started in, in terms of any need to, to, to consider uh, any kind of national approach. All uh, measures have been taken at a local level and we'll continue to liaise with the, the, the IMT as they continue their work. Thanks very much. Uh, Christine Lavelle from The Sun. Uh, thank you. Um, my question was just also on the Brazilian variant. Um, I just wanted to ask about the timeline. Um, if these three people tested positive near the start of February, can you explain why contacts and those who were on their flight um, are only being contacted now, um, almost a month on? And isn't there a risk that this timeline could have resulted in it spreading? Um, and just additionally, I just also wanted to ask, um, is the First Minister not hosting this briefing today because she's preparing for her appearance for the uh, Alex Salmond inquiry this week? Uh, so let me deal with the last part and Gregor can take you through uh, the timeline and how, uh, how this works with uh, identifying uh, tests and genomic sequencing and so on. Um, I'm sure uh, those watching today will have seen me do these briefings before. Uh, I was, uh, undertook the, the briefing on Friday, uh, have done briefings since the start of all of this, uh, and I'm doing it again today. First Minister asked me to do it. I'm the Health Secretary. It's a COVID briefing. Makes perfect sense. Gregor, do you want to do the timeline? Yeah, do, do, do you know what sequencing isn't an immediate test in the same way as um, if we were to do, well, I guess there's, there's, there's various degrees of immediacy when we test people. There's the devices such as lateral flow devices that give test results very quickly. There's the PCR results, which uh, generally give test results within a few hours to 24 hours. And then there's genomic sequencing, which is a much more involved process, and that takes longer to determine the information from. And what happens is on the receipt of a positive result, um, genomic testing can be requested for any sample. Those samples then undergo a process um, linking with the COG UK partnership across the UK. We've got two sites in um, Scotland who are part of that uh, partnership in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. And that very complex process of genomic sequencing is then undertaken to give the detail um, that we are now starting to become more familiar with in terms of identifying the, the exact um, viral genomes associated with each case. Now, in the future, what I expect is that that process will become even shorter over time. And there is work which is currently undergoing, which I think is of particular interest, which will look to see how we um, gradually evolve the PCR tests that we have available to us so that the primer um, site used in those tests actually becomes much more specific towards some of these variants of concern and give us much more immediacy in the, the, the timing of the results. We were very fortunate with, with the B117 variant when it arose in the UK that we were able to identify that through a proxy measure on the, on the PCR test because it didn't express on the S gene uh, just as much as other variants have. So that gave us an ability to be able to detect that even from PCR. But at this moment in time, we're wholly dependent on this rather more prolonged process of genomic sequencing in order that we identify these other variants. Thanks very much. Uh, Alistair Grant from The Herald. Uh, hi there, thanks very much. Just to follow on from uh, what was just said there, just about the Brazilian variant. Um, I know you said that genomic sequencing isn't an, an, an immediate process. Is there a kind of rough time scale as to how long that process takes usually, because uh, if the contacts of these three travellers are being traced now, uh, how long will it be until we know if others test positive for this variant? 
Uh, and should passengers that were on the flight from London to Aberdeen, should they be contacting the authorities themselves or should they just be waiting, I suppose, to be to be contacted by, by someone? Um, and just finally as well, is there any figure for how many people have been asked to self-isolate uh, in the aftermath of these uh, the Brazilian dairy in Aberdeen? Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Alistair. On your point about um, should people contact if they were on that flight, should they uh, get in touch with anyone? No, uh, they should wait because they will be contacted. Uh, many have been already. Uh, any who have not been will be contacted very shortly. In fact, they may well have been contacted while we were doing this briefing. So uh, just wait until um, our test and protect teams contact you uh, and then they'll, they'll go through uh, the process with you. Uh, on your, your other question about uh, the numbers uh, who have been asked to self-isolate, I don't have uh, that number uh, with me at the moment. Uh, if we do have that number confirmed, then we'll certainly get that to you later on today, bearing in mind uh, that the, the number itself may increase uh, as the contact tracing uh, work continues uh, through until uh, the local team uh, takes the view that they have uh, exhausted all the contacts and the contacts of contacts. Uh, and at that point, uh, they feel able to say that they have completed that piece of work. So the numbers who may be asked to self-isolate uh, will, it is possible that uh, whatever they are right now, that those numbers could increase. In terms of the timescale of genomic sequencing, um, and maybe Gregor, if you'd say a bit more about how that works. Yeah, because of the degree of interest and precaution that's been taken around about this incident in relation to these three individuals, any positive samples that are identified as a consequence of those inquiries just now, we've got um, agreement that those will be treated with urgency and an accelerated process will be deployed for those so that we'll be able to get those results back in a matter of days. Uh, rather than the time that's taken for this particular, uh, these particular results to come back. So um, I would be confident that um, if there is anything which begins to become um, apparent in terms of positive cases which may be associated with these cases, um, then we'll be able to get the answers to that in a much shorter time scale than we did for um, the, these results in this case. Thank you very much. And uh, our last journalist today is Elsa Mishman. Uh, from the Scotsman. Elsa, I hope I got your surname correct there. Yeah, you did. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, I just wanted to return to care homes, um, if that's all right with you. I'm sure you're aware that um, there's a group of campaigners who want the visiting guidance, the allowance for a, a, a designated visitor, to be made into law um, to make sure that care homes um, or care home providers comply with it. Um, you said in response to an earlier question that you've been speaking to care home providers, that you've been kind of consulting with them in order to, to put that um, new guidance together. Are there any more stricter measures that you could take to ensure that they do comply with the guidance? Um, and is there anything else that you can do to kind of reassure um, relatives of those in care homes who are still worried, despite the discussions and the consultations, who are, who are really concerned that without it being law, um, care home providers won't comply with that guidance? Thanks very much, Elsa. It is an important point. Um, uh, I've, had, I've had those discussions myself uh, with Care Home, the Care Home Relatives Group, uh, and they helpfully uh, worked with us too on the guidance that has now been issued. Um, my, my approach at this point is to uh, try and take as many with me as I possibly can. Um, not only uh, relatives and listening to their concerns and trying to act on that as we have done on the guidance uh, and organisations who uh, are engaged in this, like Scottish Care and CCPS, but also care home providers, uh, the vast majority of whom, if not all, want the best for their residents in every respect. But there is, of course, understandable concerns. There are some practical issues for care home providers in delivering on this guidance, some of which I touched on earlier. And there are some concerns too uh, around whether or not uh, the risk is such that they can uh, have uh, designated visitors uh, in to uh, spend time, meaningful contact and time uh, with their loved ones in care homes. And that's why uh, not only I, but, but my officials 
uh, have undertaken regular discussions with uh, individual providers and with care home providers as a group to try and uh, give them the evidence that supports why we believe it is now possible to move in this direction and also any support that we can give them to address practical concerns that they might have. Remembering too that uh, some time ago we um, made sure that there was a local nurse, nurse director led, director of public health led primary care support to care homes to make sure that they had uh, everything that they needed as well of course as what we did some time ago uh, by way of making sure that if their own PPE supply uh, was faltering or wasn't giving them everything they needed that we intervened in order to make sure that could happen and, and that continues to be the case. Uh, so I understand the, the view that says if, if you just passed a law that would make it happen. It doesn't in my view work quite like that. I would rather work hard to bring providers with me to do this because they are confident that they can, that the risk is manageable, that they have everything in place to protect their residents and their staff from the risk of coronavirus than to enter into some kind of compunction. Even so, that, op that option of course remains. Uh, but at this stage, I think we are moving with some success to bring our large care home providers like HC1, Barchester and others with us on this uh, important journey to open up our care homes with care, uh, to give residents and families the level of meaningful contact that will make such a difference to them. And where there are individual instances, then I will continue to pick those up individually, talk to the providers, uh, have my officials work with them to see what more we can do. Uh, and I have confidence that as we do that, we will get to uh, the middle towards the end of this month, at the middle if it's at all possible, and see all of our care homes open to that meaningful contact in a way that the providers and the staff are confident about what they're doing. And the only exception would be a care home that has an, itself an outbreak of COVID-19, uh, where of course that's not possible, but it is possible once the outbreak is over. That's us for today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you uh, to our journalists uh, for joining us and for their questions. Uh, thanks to uh, Jill, uh, our BSL interpreter, to Gregor for joining me, but most of all, uh, my thanks to all of you for taking the time yet again uh, to tune in and join us. It is a year on since our first coronavirus 19 case. That's quite a milestone, but a year on with all the sacrifices and the difficulties and the heartbreak and anguish that many of you have endured, uh, we are seeing really positive signs that as we move uh, out of our current situation with caution, absolutely, with care, that uh, we are moving out of lockdown in a way that we intend does not mean we move back. The vaccination programme is a real positive for all of us, uh, but it's on its own not sufficient. So right now, all of us need to stick with it. We need to remember that the most important rule is the rule yesterday and last week, and that is please stay at home. If you're in any level four area, which is of course the whole of mainland Scotland, uh, then you should only be leaving home for essential purposes. Uh, if you uh, are out, then you should remember the facts guidance, the face coverings, the avoiding crowded places, the cleaning hands and hard surfaces, <coughs> the maintaining of two metres distance and self-isolate and per um, get a test if you have any symptoms. <coughs> Excuse me, it is making a difference to all of us. It is protecting all of us. It's saving lives. And I'm very grateful to all of you for that. Thank you very much.